Yeah. Oh. Too far. Just, just a little bit. Yeah. Or three times, you know, three. Yeah. A third of that is what it needs to be spent. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I could understand if it was like a five hundred thousand dollar house. There are a lot of expensive places. Here. Yeah, sure. Well, they said there are twenty six homes in some suburb that are comparable in value. A local church buys a one point eight million dollar parsonage to attract a preacher in a place where your average home is about $150,000. Likewise, I threw out my first aid kit because it did not bring me joy. Let's see what you got. You got Joe with you guys. But does this bring you joy? No. Get rid of it? That's fine. <laughs> 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 Yeah, I think the median home value in Houston is like 150 houses. Yeah, it is. I mean, that's crazy. Yeah. So it's just it's 100 times, times that. Yeah, or yeah. 10 times that. Yeah, 10 times. Yeah. 100 times? Yeah. Maybe <laughs> 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 knowledgeable skills. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Exactly. Yeah. I need to add knowledge. Thank you for listening. This is the Lord's Army Radio Dispatch. I'm Skip. Michael and I. So we are continuing uh, to dig into Second Peter 1 uh, verses 2 through 11, that section that allows us to make sure that we're leading fruitful lives, lives that are not pointless, uh, lives that when we die, uh, we can be proud of because we've borne fruit for the kingdom. Um, quick note, by the way, on my um, to explain the joke about the first aid thing. If you haven't watched the show on Netflix where uh, this the lady goes around and she'll say, you know, you need to thank this rug for its service uh, and get rid of it. And if it doesn't bring you joy, she's basically she preaches Japanese minimalism, um, which is not a bad thing. It's a good thing to be decluttered. It's not exactly a good thing as a Christian to be talking to objects as if they're alive, because we recognize that this pair of scissors may not bring me joy but it may serve a purpose, but it definitely does not need to be thanked for its work. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> All right. So that, I think, violates the knowledge of the first five. Yes, we're speaking about knowledge this morning. <laughs> yeah, exactly, which is very little knowledge. Um, and also the $1.8 million parsonage. We were going on that for a while, too, before, before right before the recording of this episode. <laughs> Again, that's 10 times the average home value in the, in the market. <laughs> which is fine. My application must have gotten passed over. Yeah, I, I think we were rejected for that. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Uh, they, they were, you know, they claim that there are about 25, between 25 and 30 comparable homes in that zip code. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, well, you know, should, should our pastors really be in that high a percentile of our neighborhood? Of a very populous area. To, be, to have yeah, so yeah. many homes in that area, and there's only 25 comparable properties. Yes. Not sure that's... I mean, I'm all, we, we should pay, we should pay ministers of the word, they're due, yeah. um, nothing wrong with that, but when it's 10 times the average, and you're in the upper, you're like one of the top 25 homes in the entire city, Yeah, that's an issue. Oh yeah, and it's, uh, 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 I'm going to stutter, it's an affluent area too, yeah. it's, it's not a, a poor area, he just happens to be, you know, no, it's a very affluent area, and I'm actually going to point to Osteen as a, a, a model here on this. I've actually heard that he doesn't take any salary from the church and he, he gains all of his income from his uh, book sales. Yeah. And, you know, that credit to him for doing that. That's, that's an honorable thing. Um, there are some churches that, that, that way overpay their pastors when they, or their preachers when they could give them a lot less and do a lot more good you know, open a community center yeah. for underprivileged kids. Uh, do something like that with your millions of dollars. You know how big a community center you can build for $1.8 million? Oh, yeah. yeah. You can build a couple <laughs> of them, you know. Yeah. Exactly. And uh, the opportunities are limitless when you have that kind of money. Um, and, you know, I, I, I'm a preacher. I understand that. Like, he, and, and it's kind of a shame that we're in his business. We actually know that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but when you... 
when you flaunt what you have to that degree, you know, that you go that far above and beyond everybody else in the community, you know, at one point, what point are you uh, leaving the role of a spiritual example and being someone who is just as worldly as everyone else mm-hmm. around you? Um, you know, where, where does you, where's your treasure? Uh, is it here on earth or is it heavenly? Is it things that are from above? If it's, 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 you know, it's hard to long for anything if you live in a $1.8 million house. Jesus says it's hard for a, for a rich man to get into heaven. It's easier for a camel to fit through the eye of a needle. So why would you want to set up that kind of stumbling block for your preacher? Yes. <laughs> yeah. um, you're making it hard for that person. Let's not do that. Um, you know, in, in this in scenario, we, we know very little about it. And so, you know, this is only speaking based on what we know. But, you know, I... I'd be more concerned from the church's perspective. I'd be more concerned uh, about the church leadership that authorized this kind of, okay, yeah, that, that seems like a good idea. Um, the, yeah. the preacher himself accepting that, you know, if they're willing to give it, you know, that's that's another thing. But um, yeah, if someone's saying this is going to say, hey, I'll give you a $1.8 million house, you should respond, okay, you know, and that's fine. The, but yeah, exactly. It's it's more the fault of the church leadership than it is whoever is accepting that offer. Although there's some discernment issues there as well. Yeah. You know, do I really want to go work for someone that he's offering that? But anyway, and we said something nice about Joel Osteen in this podcast um, before all the hate email comes. Keep in mind, it was a specific thing. Yes, oh yes. <laughs> Specifically only to the <laughs> fact that he doesn't draw salary from the church. <laughs> yes. So don't go. Re- this should not be your best life now. Uh, lots of other things uh, he says wrong. Um, most of what he says is trash, but um, that was a specific good thing. <laughs> Just disclaimer. <laughs> yes. And so what we've been talking about is is in Second Peter 1, we've, we've got to the point of virtue and knowledge. And if we learn more about God's word, we see more in God's word. We see that the pitfalls of some of these things we're talking about, as Skip pointed out, Jesus said that it, it's going to be hard. With great difficulty, the rich enter the kingdom of heaven. And in fact, he uses an impossible illustration. The fact that a camel cannot fit through the eye of a needle. Just, it doesn't happen. Right. And the, the disciples there, they ask, well, then who can be saved? And, and Jesus says, well, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. There is a potential for salvation for the rich. But it's with great difficulty. It's a temptation. It's a challenge. And I mean, if you're listening to this podcast right now, uh, it's very likely that you are the rich. You, Jesus would claim, call you as rich. Uh, if you have the ability to listen to a podcast on the Internet, I mean, that's that's a sign of wealth. Well, and, and compared to the world, uh, I mean, like your illustration um, a couple of days ago, but uh, uh, compared to the world, virtually everyone listening to this podcast like you said, is rich because uh, most people you know, at some point today, we'll have probably three or four conversations about where do you want to eat? What do you want to eat? Yeah. All of those things. That's a pretty exclusive conversation. Most of the world's not saying, what do we want to eat today? It's more like, can we? Eat? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and that's that's our concern. We, we do live in so much comfort. Uh, and I think about the apostles. We were just talking about that. Uh, Paul spent many of his nights in prison or in chains, you know, traveling. Uh, he Many of the apostles went about destitute. Jesus had no place to lay his head. Uh, you know, when we say, okay, well, we're, we're poor. Well, yeah, uh, we, we might not have all the luxuries of other people just down the street from us, but we have relative wealth. I was feeling sorry for myself the other day. I have an iPhone 5C, which is an old iPhone. And uh, I was like, man, I just, I wish, wish I had a little bit more money so I could get a new phone. Um, even though it works fine, it's just old. <laughs> and so then I was immediately struck with how terrible a thought that was. I mean, not that that's a, not that wanting new things is always a bad thing, but just the, I don't know, the sort of arrogance of that I deserve a new phone because. <laughs> well, it, it uh, can show signs of ungratefulness. Yeah. I think that's what you're bringing out. Exactly. Uh, you know, if we're, we're always looking for something else, then we're probably missing what we already have. And being ungrateful is, is a terrible thing. Um, we get so upset at kids for, for being ungrateful, unappreciative, uh, just disrespectful. And, and we do that with God all the time. I mean, think about all the blessings God has given us. 
and how often we thank him. Uh, so many times when we feel we're in need, we ask, God, 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 please, you know, give me this, give me this, give me this. I need this. And then after we receive it, you know, how many times are we praying, God, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, oftentimes it's much less than the asking. Well, we talked very little about it. <laughs> that's, that's right. Well, let's that's keep good. talking about this. Keep talking about gratefulness. Yeah. I mean, really, that does tie into self-control, yeah. which is the beginning of verse 6. Well, let's, let's dive into it. You go ahead. Yeah. With, um, you know, after knowledge. Yeah. Got that 10 minutes? Yep. Cool. All right, so we haven't really dug into our passage, but we sort of have. Um, we sort of backed into, um, you know, we, we're we going through this. We, we were in verse 5 at the end of it, um, adding to faith virtue, adding to virtue knowledge. And beginning of verse 6, sort of what we've been talking about is to knowledge self-control. Um, it can be very difficult sometimes once you, you know, again, sort of thinking of the logical progression of these things, once you begin to do virtuous things and you're doing it based on the word and you're doing it based on what you know and you're gaining knowledge and you're gaining these things then you start to notice or at least i did other areas of sin in my life such as my cell phone you know not that my cell phone's an area of sin but it's my ungratefulness about what i have um, and those types of things you begin to then struggle with controlling yourself and also not being a jerk too i mean i think it's part of the passage too is you gain knowledge you don't want to be arrogant and puffed up in your knowledge. Um, so you've got sort of that that sense of self-control, meaning like keeping myself from acting arrogant to other people, but also, I mean, we're to be controlling, controlled of ourselves in every area of our life. For sure, and self-control, <clears throat> you know, we talked about how this these things build on one another. Uh, self-control is simply applied knowledge. You know what to do, and so you control yourself and do the right thing or not do the wrong thing. Uh, you don't do the wrong thing. Uh, and so that's, that's, I think, a beautiful thing about this progression is, well, you, you can't control yourself if you don't know what is right and what is wrong or what you should and should not do. Uh, I do like Skip's point about, you know, the, the arrogance there is something I really hadn't considered before. But with, with, with knowledge can come arrogance. And so controlling yourself and humbling yourself uh, is, is value there, valuable there. Um, but it's the, the the wrestling of ourselves under control. Yeah, it's almost it's almost like you're building like a roller coaster here. I mean, you've got um, you you know first you need you have to believe in it, you have to want to do it, and then as you begin to build this thing, I think of knowledge as sort of like the rails that the that the that it rides on. Um, but then now you've got the rails, you've got where you're gonna you know what path you're gonna follow thanks to the knowledge, and now you need to keep yourself <laughs> on that path need to keep you know keep your cart from going off the rails now that you know what's right you got to do what's right yeah and, and speaking to that there's so many passages about walking in the light in first john um you know we how we should draw near to god uh the the close proximity to god is, is something that we should should strive for and this is all part of our self-control what are we spending our time doing um who are we surrounding ourselves with and those are all choices we actually can make and they all contribute to controlling ourselves. Uh, you know, well, well, what am I doing, and and how can I go about changing that if it doesn't align with God's will? Yeah, exactly. Fighting. So one of my one of my favorite books um, outside of scripture is uh, Pilgrim's Progress. Pilgrim's Progress is this phenomenal book by John Bunyan, um, and it's kind of two parts. Both parts are great, but. In the first part, Christian is the name of the main character, um, so kind of an obvious allusion to just being a Christian. Uh, Christian's the main character, and one of the main, most vicious people that attacks him as he's on his way to the celestial city is self, this enemy of self who has these fiery darts, and, and Christian gets in this big battle, and, and self is trying to drag Christian back to the city of destruction and keep him from getting to the celestial city. And that's something that I use in my home with, with my kids, and then, um, but it also works for me too. It's just the remembrance that 
self is trying to destroy you. <laughs> and it's just as true outside of that book as in that book. You know, you, there is a version of you that wants to see you drug back to the city of destruction and you need to make war with self. Yeah, you're exactly right. And, and there's so much written about self-control and so much written about humility because Jesus is our example. Who He's an example of sacrifice, service, humility. Uh, he submitted to God's will and not his own. And he said that, he prayed that on the night before he died, not my will, but yours, but thine. And so it, it's a wrestling of self. And so he controlled himself and said, okay, God, I'm going to do what you want me to do. And that's the essence of Christianity. Okay, well, what would Christ do? What would Jesus do? I know that's, you know, that the catchphrase, the, it's cliched, but it's true. What would Jesus do? And wrestling ourselves and, and, and conforming ourselves to that uh, rather than conforming ourselves to the world or, or what we would want ourselves to be uh, that's selfish. So staying self-controlled, too, is really the next sort of section to self-control perseverance. Um, controlling yourself in a moment. I, I make this joke all the time, um, but, you know, and it's, it's a stolen joke from my dad. My dad used to say, I have no problem quitting smoking. I do it all the time. I always say, I have no problem starting a diet. I do it all the time. <laughs> so that's, that's self-control in short bursts, yes. which is not really self-control at all. Um, yeah, when I think of this, and, and the English standard uses steadfastness, uh, I, I think they're you know similar enough words for sure. Yeah. Uh, but I think of, of athletics again uh, with sports. Uh, you, you don't want the batter that can hit it the farthest um, for one good time. You right. want the batter who can bat 350 and, you know, one out of three times he steps up to the plate, he's going to make a good hit <laughs> and he hits home runs consistently. You, you want someone who can bat consistently. You, you don't want someone who can make a jump shot once in their life. <laughs> you want someone who can make a jump shot every time they take it, or at least, you know, a lot of the times they take it. Um, and the same way with your quarterback, you don't want your quarterback to make the best throw ever once. <laughs> you want him to be able to throw a good pass consistently, a catchable ball. And as Christians, it's no different. You know, God wants servants who are consistent, who are steadfast. That's not to say that we'll be perfect. I mean, everybody makes mistakes. Going back to athletics, I mean, you, you have batters, you have basketball players, and you have football players that make mistakes. It's not that, that they the mistakes define them. It's who they are most consistently and, you know, whether or not they're submitting to God's way. Yeah, I think of the same thing in sales. Um, sales is very much like sports in that same sort of way. You have some, you, you know, one of the most deadly things that can happen to a young seller is getting a big sale right out of the gate, um, whether it's real estate or, or you name it, because then they get that sort of taste of what this big success is, and that can cause them to be lazy in these other things, and so they stop doing the fundamentals. It's always, always do the fundamentals. The ones who are successful sellers for an entire career are the ones who are doing those fundamentals every single day, regardless of whether it's a good month, bad month, big win, small win. Um, it's about doing the right thing every single morning when you come in. Um, that's Those are the ones who sort of make it in sales. Those are the ones who make it in sports. And frankly, those are the ones who have the easiest walk with Christ. They're the ones who every single morning get up and ask, okay, what should I do today? And how can I be more faithful today, for sure? Um, I think of, of Romans 12. This is a passage that we could have used for learning. Um, in verse 2, uh, Romans 12, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Uh, he says there, don't be conformed to the world. Don't be like everybody else. Uh, be different. And he says, be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Uh, that's something that should be taking place on a daily basis. Uh, that's something that we should do consistently. Whatever it takes for you to, to be transformed by the renewal of your mind every day. Uh, and that will bring about consistent success, uh, consistent self-control. Um, I'm, I'm with you. you know, I, that's the way I've always looked at it, steadfastness, perseverance. 
is consistent self-control. Am, am I able to do this more often than I'm not able to do this? And the renewing of our mind daily uh, is something that should be at the center of that. Uh, because if you wait for Sundays and Wednesdays, you're going to fall flat on your face. If you wait till just the times the church gathers together, you are going to be malnourished, you're going to be weak, you're going to fail. You have to be in the word. You have to be fellowshipping with other Christians. You have to be praying consistently if you want to grow. Uh, those kind of things have to be in your life if you want that kind of steadfastness. Exactly. All right. Well, this concludes this episode of the Lord's Army. Trey, do you have an announcement to make? Oh. Oh, yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> so I uh, am going to be a daddy. Congratulations. <laughs> that's, that's exciting. Congratulations. Yeah. Are you going to keep it? <laughs> well, I wasn't planning on any trips uh, up north. So. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> Thankfully, no, we all value you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> but yeah, no, congratulations. Thank that's you. That's huge. Very cool. Well, prayers for Trey. <laughs> and uh, prayers for this ministry as well. Prayers for you. We, uh, we will continue to pray for you. Thank you so much for listening. If you want more valuable tools and resources, just go to lordsarmy.org.